as per each individual. Psychiatrist. Psychiatrist. Yes. Yeah. Less than ten, 10 psychiatrists yeah. in total. Wow. In so, the country. Mm -hmm. so yes, that means yeah. it's an area with, that we need we to need think to of in. now. Mm -hmm. We need to invest now because we'll have sequelae after this mm -hmm. and we'll not be able to deal with it. I think another concern, which was also in the previous SARS and MERS, is the mental health care, oh, the, the health care workers, the frontline workers. Their mental health is really um, uh, taking, having great, there's great consequences for having to deal with this. Um, patients that's severely ill and you have a limited capacity whether you feel supported by um, your institution um, so so that we also need to not forget our our health workers and then the other thing is the patients already have mental illness so patients with bipolar disorder schizophrenia patients with OCD um, anxiety and depressive disorders are a lot um, higher at risk of having a relapse in their symptoms. They might be scared to go to their clinic and go get their their injection or their medication. Um, or the, the isolation, the quarantine might be even worse mm -hmm. for these patients mm -hmm. who really need the support of the community and the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a very alienating disease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you are alienated from your family members, you're alienated mm -hmm. from your friends. Working in the units on a daily basis, you can see how much, how much of a toll it has on those patients. They cannot even speak because they, they are on a ventilator, obviously, but some of them are awake and they speak into what we call a CPAP machine, trying to reach out to somebody, trying to get that human touch. So what we want to encourage is we want to reach out to each other, even if it's not physically. Just take a phone and call somebody if you need to. Don't suffer alone. Patients can't even really see the ho the doctors because everybody's in PPE and and mm -hmm. masks and so on. There's a very concerning question here, stating I have anxiety and prone to panic attacks. Now the person says they are scared if they get COVID, they won't cope emotionally. In an instance like that, what would you advise, Dr. Miela? Okay, in that case, it's a vicious circle. Remember we are saying anxiety symptoms themselves present with fear, isn't it? Mm -hmm. With fear and they're anxious to also go out. You know, they have physical symptoms. Now, this is a person who is well, but worried that they might contract the illness while they don't actually have the illness. So that itself is feeding their anxiety. So it is like Dr. Breve said, do what you can control, you know? Take control of the situation that you can. Some of the things you won't be able to control. But even the thought process itself, we say when you have a therapist or somebody you can talk to, they teach you how to, to be in control of these thoughts instead of going continuously without having answers. Because you're obviously answering yourself, but you're answering yourself negatively, fear, making yourself fearful. Therefore, your stress level keep going up. Mm -hmm. And therefore, therefore, your symptoms of your anxiety also is going up. But we are saying also most of the people with anxiety are on medication. This is the time that you need to keep your medication. The one concern people are worried about when we give them medication, they say, are you giving me your medication that makes people dependent? Not all the medications make a person dependent or, 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 or addictive. And also, what would you be? Would you want to be on medication and be in control of your situation and be in control of your health? Or would you rather be ha having the anxiety but not being on treatment? Which is also coming back to the system, to the question of your vaccination. If you take your vaccination, you know you will also not be as anxious as you are. And the panic attacks also, they come because you are worried. But if you learn how to control that, that worry, then you are okay, you will be able to have that. Even somebody who doesn't have anxiety, obviously in this unknown, because of the unknown of COVID, that is why they are worried. But w we're saying that we have come a long way from where we were last year and where we are now. Whatever is available, use it. And we are saying also, we advocate for our patients. But another way of also looking at how we can... Um, titrate the information down is look at who does this person look up to or believe in. For example, in the villages, we use the leaders 
And then we inform them more about mental health, with the effect of COVID, the effect of vaccine, how to use. And then they titrate it down to the people because somebody will look at this and then listen and then go for that. For, for that. And then we're saying we're also there at all the time. Use those toll-free toll numbers uh, and the numbers we gave you and then, you know, reach out. And the interesting thing is your brain and your body speaks to each other. So mm -hmm. if you are anxious or stressed or depressed, it actually affects your immune system and it makes yeah. you more vulnerable mm -hmm. to infection. So if somebody has anxiety or depression, rather go see a psychologist or GP or psychiatrist because we have very good treatment for anxiety and depression. So that if you do get COVID, you'll, you're probably going to be okay because mm -hmm. you'll have your anxiety at least under control. Dealing with that. Yeah, so I just quickly want to do a quick time check. How much time do we still have? And uh, are there questions that need to be responded to um, from the platforms? About 30 minutes left. Uh, but then again, my suggestion for now would be to skip question seven. That's now what to do when contracting COVID because it was answered yes, during, the, during the anxiety. So questions go, go straight to the questions for the ministry and that's now on the question of oxygen i think yesterday and, and i think what we'll also do um, because there's clearly a lot more questions than what we have time mm -hmm. um, when we do convene because we need to let nbc go to the normal scheduling mm -hmm. we will continue to sit here and we'll make sure that we answer the questions i can see all my panelists are looking at me shocked like what <laughs> is this woman talking about <laughs> <laughs> but, but we'll make sure that the questions that we do have, um, we'll put them into written form and make sure mm. that they are circulated sure. on our social media and platforms. The crew can also stay on just to record so that we can Fantastic. broadcast it during okay. one of our slots, the entire, entire program. Excellent. Thanks, Brad. Okay, so I will also skip some of the questions to the ministry, and that is now the question on hospitals are running out of oxygen patients are left to die and you people are here advocating for people to vaccinate it. Especially at Kadutura Hospital, the situation is saddening. Dr. Elson. I think that, that those are two separate points. So the first point is, the question you need to ask yourself is why have we reached the capacity for oxygen in the state facilities? We know that we have a, an oxygen plant at Ventuk Central Hospital. And we know that the oxygen plant can produce about 600 liters to some degree uh, on an hourly basis. And the COVID ICU in and of itself uses 300 liters of oxygen every hour. That's 50% of the capacity. Two years ago, we did not have a COVID ICU. So just imagine that. So now we still have the cardiac unit, which is also an intensive care unit. Now we also have the main ICU, which is also an intensive care unit. Just imagine for yourself the burden that this disease has put on the state facilities. This is only Vintuk Central Hospital. With regards to Katatura Hospital, we have had respiratory patients in the past, particularly patients who um, suffer from tuberculosis, and of course the sequelae of, of tuberculosis. Dr. Brevere can speak to that. We have patients who have been oxygen dependent already in the past, and they would require continuous oxygen from the state as, as they are state patients. So speaking to that point, I think when you, when you are saying that the hospital does not have oxygen and they're, making, uh, they're causing the deaths of all of these patients, and then on the other hand, you're saying that you're being coerced or being forced to take the vaccine, I think those two people, uh, it's, it's, it seems to me like it's a duality actually. So what we need to cons consider is, are we going to wait for natural immunity does it mean that we're going to let all of our pregnant mothers die from coronavirus? Does it mean that we're going to let all of our elders die from coronavirus? Or does it mean that we're going to step up, address this problem as a, as a nation and really get ourselves vaccinated? And I think really that is the point of the answer. It's not that we, we were not prepared for this. This is just that it's an unprecedented pandemic that we are currently faced with. And I think the private hospitals themselves also have been overburdened. I, I, I wanted to cut in there and say, I mean, it's, it's not only a, a, a state hospital problem. Oxygen is a worldwide problem. I mean, we, um, no, no government, no private healthcare facility can plan and manage uh, 
pandemic. It's, we can't have the infrastructure to manage the amount of patients. Um, at the facility where I work, I mean, we, we're going to through 1.2 tons of oxygen a day. I mean, the, the, the companies that have to deliver that oxygen, they don't have the production capacity for that. And the, why do we need it? Because we've suddenly got this massive surge of patients where they require oxygen as a life-saving um, life modality. And what were you using before COVID? Oh, I mean, we, j just to give you an idea, our, our backup system, we only had five tons of oxygen. So um, we had to double up on that, and even that is 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 struggling. Um, so I mean, we we weren't we're probably at about double capacity at the moment, what we what we use, um, and it, that that's a concern. And I'm sitting there every day having, for instance, they, 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 when the when the pandemic started, we had. Um, we struggled with ventilators. We didn't have enough ventilators, so we bought a few extra ventilators, and then and the South Africans published data on using a device which we call high flow oxygen um, in in helping patients or patients who uh, high flow preventing them from getting to a ventilator basically but the the difference is a normal ventilator uses between five and ten liters of, of oxygen per minute these high flow ventilators they use sixty liters of oxygen per minute so it, it so what's happened now is i can't use those devices because we, we we can't supply enough oxygen for these devices to to work bearing in mind everything else we we're having to um we're having to manage and and that puts us really in a in a difficult situation because i have to now decide which patients can i help and which which i can't help and i'm sitting there every day and thinking what on earth can we do to get out of this system and every time i get back to the same answer we have to vaccinate mm -hmm. we have to try and prevent this struggle that the hospitals are going through because the hospital system will never be able to cope no matter if it's private no matter if it's public no matter if it's first world if it's developing world the the reality is healthcare cannot protect against the pandemic it's mm -hmm. it's just not possible yeah, and i think if you take the vaccine out of this equation you find yourself hitting against a brick wall there's no way around it i think it's really something that the nation really needs to take up very strongly yeah, yeah. Dr. Ellison, I don't know if it's, it was you on television, but there was a state doctor who looked like you, who, who made a point that I didn't forget, where he said, hospitals are not the front line. Mm -hmm. We want to keep you out of the hospitals because we can't cope and we'll never cope. We can get more oxygen, but we don't have enough healthcare workers. We don't, uh, so, and I found that quite a compelling um, point. I'd just like to, to, to sketch the scenario for you a little bit. In, for example, in Katatura Hospital, we have had to transform four wards separately. Yeah. Apart from the respiratory unit that we've, we've used as a sort of a sounding board to try and absorb some of these patients, we've had to open up four separate wards just for COVID um, in Katatura Hospital. That is outside of what we've had to do for, for Bantuk Central Hospital. That is outside of the military hospital, which is basically a tent which we've had to mobilize. And now you can imagine all of those medical officers that have had to have been mobilized. All of our specialist physicians are stretched to their capacity. I think everybody is spread thinly over. It really is, it's not as if nothing is being done. On a daily basis, you find yourself on the verge of tears when you have to decide between somebody who's, for example, 34 years old or somebody who's 55 years old, but they're both productive members of society. So really we are very, very short-staffed and very very we are pushing ourselves so i want uh, also everybody to know that we really are not just standing behind being lackadaisical efforts are being made mm -hmm. actually on a minute-to-minute -minute basis if you think about it mm -hmm. i think i also need to comment on that I, I think we need to applaud the ministry and the private private ho hospitals um, it's not only also just the, the katutura and the cent the central itself the military that we we, we, we have opened but it's also now a requirement like even for us at mental health mm -hmm. there is provision that we need to make every day you see to say okay which of the words can we mm -hmm. transform mm -hmm. to accommodate our patients who are COVID positive because within 
them having a mental illness, they also have COVID. Mm. So obviously people are like, now where do you accommodate this person? Yes, it's our own, own owner, owners to at least treat them. But then some on the other hand, well, then we need also need to look at and say, these people are just human like every other person. Mm. And therefore COVID does not discriminate to say you are mental, you have a mental problem or something. Mm -hmm. But also out there, honestly, we need to honor really the me healthcare workers they are so way overstressed mm -hmm. even the nurses are working more than 12 hour shift mm -hmm. but mentally wise we are saying this is also not healthy mm -hmm. for our people because we are now exposing them to develop mental health problems and it is not uncommon for us to see our own health workers being on antidepressants, anti-anxieties, and, and, and psycho psychotic um, medications, antipsychotic medication. We are saying that we have to work together to support them, mm -hmm. even support the people who have the illness itself. It's for them to wave through that. You know, it is very bad when you are sick, when you have the COVID and you don't have a support. Mm -hmm. But also remember the front front workers, mm -hmm. you know, really they don't have a system where they are supporting themselves. Mm -hmm. So often with if you have 50 or 60 or 100 COVID patients that you're treating, there are 50 or 60 or 100 patients, family members, mm -hmm. worried, phoning, texting, mm -hmm. getting angry because the doctor's not getting back to you in time. So I, I don't think the public also realizes that these doctors get, you know, phoned 100 times a day. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the night, mm -hmm. every half an hour, every night, and then you go and do your work. So. Um, and that's why you really are encouraging people, please do what you can do, and that is vac vaccinate, social distance, wear masks. Dr. Ellison, have you been faced with angry abuse of family <laughs> members and Dr. Brevet, you? So I'm currently rotating in the COVID ICU, and I can tell you that, y yes, family members want, they physically want to come to you, <laughs> and in as much as that is impossible, and sometimes they are frustrated with the, the, the little bit of information that you give them. We have to limit what we say to them mm -hmm. because we don't want to be too harsh with our, with, our, with our relatives. But also we don't have enough time because the more time we spend talking to relatives, the less time we have available in the unit to be able to treat our patients. And I have to tell you that they are critical patients. They really literally need to be seen moment to moment, minute to minute, hour to hour. So the more time we spend trying to console our relatives, the less time we have. Mm -hmm. So I think people need to be reassured that yes, we are pushing ourselves beyond our capacity and we, would, we understand where we are, we understand that you are frustrated and really we want to relieve the frustration that you have. But in, in the capacity that we are human as well and that we only have certain amount, a certain amount of time available to us, I think we need to understand that our first priority and our first concern is to our patient. I agree with that. I think um, I try and understand that that families are sitting with with also with anxiety mm -hmm. and also struggles. And I, w I always explain it like this: before the pandemic, if I had an ICU patient, and um, the the family were able to see the patient, they will they'll go through the process of realizing this patient is either deteriorating or improving, but they will be able to see this. And with 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 COVID. I think myself and the the healthcare workers, nursing, they are the only link that this the family has to their to the their loved one, which which puts a lot of extra stress on us. I, I I had this discussion yesterday. I mean, there was a time in this week where I had 55 COVID patients, where I was looking after them. I told them if I spent two minutes with every single family, I'll spend pretty much two hours just discussing with the families. I'd I I don't have that 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 time available. But in a way, one wants to, as a healthcare provider, also mm. ca care for, for the families and let them see the process that their loved one is, is going through. So it's a, it's a very difficult place to be in, I think, um, because you don't want to, to alienate the families. You want to involve them. But it is, unfortunately, the, the human resources is, is taking strain with that. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam First Lady, you have eight minutes to continue the discussion and then wrap up. Okay. So, so we've got, um, we'll continue the discussion when we're not live on NBC anymore and we'll make sure that that um, 
is provided uh, uh, to NBC and on our social media platforms. But there are a few things that I really do want to emphasize and also want to give the panelists just a moment to say what is very important to them, um, and especially on the issue of vaccines. And, and I think I am somebody who is self-reflective. And if I look at my own experience of waiting based on somebody else's health assessment before I get vaccinated and waiting for what I regarded as an ideal vaccine, I certainly put myself at a higher risk of everything I feared. All of my fears around vaccine, COVID's reality was that it was much higher risk than all of those fears. So this thing of waiting for a perfect vaccine when you don't have any medical reason to do so is waiting for perfect when good enough is available. And I'm going to rectify that what I regard to be a mistake by having a vaccine by what is available. Those with specialized conditions and who need to consult with their medical practitioners should and can do that. But I certainly don't have any condition that prevents me from getting a vaccine now. And I'd really like to start with you, um, Dr. Bouvier. So what I will vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. But I also want to ask people, everybody's struggling in a different way. Be kind, be supportive. If you know if somebody is really um, in need of help, reach out, go drop off food, help with the children who are sitting at home unsupervised. Let's, as a community, pull together and, and get through this. Because I know we can. We just need to, to take the steps and, and move forward. Okay. Um, I will advocate for mental health uh, because I'm saying that there's no health without mental health. So importantly, you need to take care of yourself. Be aware of what you are feeling, why you are feeling what you are feeling, label your emotions, and be in control of your behavior. We are saying that behavior is something that we need to learn and be, take cognizance of that and force it to somebody who's visiting you. Limit unnecessary visitations. We are so modern as we have rituals. Do that. Check up on each other on WhatsApp. But look out for those who already had mental illness because this can go both ways. COVID itself can cause a mental illness. Mental illness can cause you to have uh, a, a, a low immune system. Therefore, you will acquire COVID compared to other people. Vaccination. No, take note of who is um, circulating the information. A very important thing we did not mention is personalities. You know, personalities is very important because somebody who is having a personality that is difficult to accept other people's position and, and, and uh, respect their distance will not adhere to the rules. Also, a person who is developing psychotic symptoms some of them believe that somebody else is spying on them and therefore they can believe in Illuminati and those things. So be very careful that, that we need to also look and take care of this person. Make sure they go to mental health and make use of your mental, mental health workers yes. and behavioral science, Excellent. please. And I think that's the <laughs> most important point, uh, health care workers. Uh, Dr. Bouvet? Yeah, I, th I think the main message is as a country, we need to really pull together um, and and um, try and manage this this pandemic that we're sitting with. And we we've got the tools available. Um, we need the the motivation and the the public support in that. I mean, we need to get our our vaccine rollout going stronger, so that we can get to herd immunity. Herd immunity through infections. We're seeing a small glimpse of that now with our hospitals full, people dying. We, we can't, as an as an healthcare provider, I can't see that that being the answer to this. I mean, we, 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 we're not going to get there without severely traumatizing our nation. So I think we have to look at the evidence. We have to look at the empiric, properly done evidence that's available to us and, and use that to make decisions to get ourselves vaccinated. So my message would be, um, I want us to l limit community spread. And by limiting community spread, that means that we have to actually adhere to the social distancing. We have to adhere to wearing our masks. And most importantly, have concern for your fellow human being. Because if we do not have concern for our fellow human being, it was definitely going to turn 
into a humanitarian crisis if it's not already at that level. Because what we have to deal with is we have to deal with losing mothers and we have to deal with losing fathers. So even if you think that you can overcome this virus, consider that and get yourself vaccinated and self-isolate. Um, if, if you ask from the mental health perspective, um, the lies that, that are being spread, I have to call it bluntly lies, um, there's something we call in psychiatry called delusions. So delusions are fixed false beliefs that a person has that are not in keeping with their culture or religion. So it can be a primary person, only one person having these false delusions, to even say that they believe that the government is against them. Or that people are putting chips in their, in their plugs, therefore tuning into what they are doing at home and all also knowing what they're thinking before they even th thought or verbalize it out. So it can be just an individual. So that is just one person. But there are delusions that are shared. Mm -hmm. I am the primary one who has this delusion and I convinced Dr. Brouvet that really these people are conspiring against us, so therefore we are sharing the delusions. And unfortunately, the untruth spreads more faster than facts. So, and for our population or society, we tend to go on YouTube, so social media, and we believe on that. We feed on that. We want to believe in something or have hope in something that is not real. But now when we come with facts to tell you that actually the person you are believing is having a psychotic disorder, therefore they need medication, so therefore you yourself would need medication if you have to know what the truth is. But people tend to hide away from mental health. So people will make fun of what they are saying because it's smart people and what they are saying can make sense, mm -hmm. however it is not real. This is fed by somebody who is sick. And now... You know, the cults we have and the groups that people um, belong to, they also believe in things that are not real. So we Dr. should... Mila, yeah. can I ask you a question? Because I know medical doctors mm -hmm. who have tapped into some of these conspiracies. I know people who are regarded as highly intelligent mm -hmm. who have tapped into these theories. What, what makes people... And I know that there's scientists from across the world who've come up with evidence, who've come up with well-researched, credible data and statistics and, and, and theories. What makes me in Namibia believe that I know something that experts haven't figured out yet? Because then you call in many people I know psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. There, there's the psychotic part, but remember there's also the part I called personality disorders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, personality disorders is also a something that is very difficult to deal with. Eh? So may, mainstay is the psych psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. So they need to acknowledge that what they believe in and be proven or challenged to see and acknowledge that what they believe in is actually not the truth. And unfortunately, we're saying the behavior, the emotion and the way the person thinks is always fed on what they believe in. And sometimes it's the most challenge we get in, in that. You know, you can work with a person who is having an, an, a, a psychotic disorder, give them medication, and they start to not believe in the delusions that they have. But with the personality, they are stern in what I believe, and it's within exactly. themselves, and it must and be right. And there's cognitive dissonance, even exactly. when they are presented with evidence, with evidence that says something that's different to their mm. belief. Mm -hmm. Dr. Brevet, what would your view be? So I've, uh, I have great concerns around the general mental health of, of the world at large. Um, I have a t I'm concerned that people are no longer critically analyzing, critically thinking evidence at hand. I think one of the biggest problems is the social media platforms. Um, the, the whole generation where immediate gratification and self-absorbance and um, almost a narcissism has, has taken role, lack of empathy, lack of reflection, um, people being able to just say what they want um, to any audience and, and not necessarily take the consequences. So I think our society at large is at is in, in big trouble. 
And um, maybe we didn't realize this until a pandemic hit mm. us and we realized there are so many people out there who's doing more harm than good at the expense of the community at large. What would your yeah. message be to somebody who right now is on social media actively telling people not to get vaccinated because there's a conspiracy? I, if it is somebody that, that is uh, scientifically trained, um, if you're a medical doctor or dentist, I would advise you to go back to, to the basics, what we learned in medical school about evidence-based medicine, about looking at research, the level of evidence. So you need to go back to your, your basics and just remind yourself why you became um, a doctor or, or somebody who wants to do more harm than good. If it is somebody that's not aged, that does, do not have the right expertise to say that, I would encourage you to get off um, social media and go do something else um, that's better for your mental health. Um, go exercise, go spend time with your family. Um, it could also be people that have technological addiction. They just spend way too much time on social media, which is also a mental health disorder. And, and you probably Sorry, you need, need to say that again. For technological the addiction. The yeah. What did or you say there about <laughs> social media? A, a technological use disorder is actually also a mental health disorder. If you if you are addicted or you use te technology more than you should be. I needed be. you to say that just so I can <laughs> speak to my, They know so who they are. <laughs> yeah. So so maybe it's time to to reflect at your own mental health, at your own um, yeah well being, and and look for help. Go see a psychologist, psychiatrist, and there might be a bigger issue that you need help with. There are questions around the types of vaccine. Question one is, why aren't the elderly advised to wait for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as the president? That's question one that Dr. Brewer can answer. And then the other one is from the social media page of Flon. Elaine de Klerk wanting to know, are we going to die after two years because we took the AstraZeneca vaccine? Let me take the, f the first question with regards to the, the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine. I don't, I don't think um, Johnson Johnson vaccine is the only vaccine that you can use for elderly. Um, AstraZeneca is a vaccine that you can use clearly in, in elderly people. It's been studied um, in, in that population. This, the Sinopharm vaccine, the WHO currently doesn't doesn't make a recommendation in the in the group older than 60 because it's it's been been studied and i think um in in last week's discussion i i clearly indicated that that one should not generalize one recommendation to everybody um i think that's a, that's a, a dangerous thing if i for instance say any 80 year old or 70 year old or how old should wait for the the johnson and johnson vaccine without taking in to account the whole health pro profile of that of a specific individual i will rec make wrong make recommendations so i think one has to individualize um, and not take the the individual recommendation as a blanket rule for everybody um, but in saying that, um, as if we look at what the WHO guidelines say with regards to the vaccines, there are certain vaccines that we can use in older people and other vaccines that we can safely use in younger, younger people. Taking, um, for instance, the Pfizer vaccine. Now, we know that the Pfizer vaccine is available and safe for younger people, and 12 to 18 year olds, whereas we don't know the AstraZeneca or the, mm. the Sinopharm vaccine in that population. So this, the, the, there are certain guidelines that we have to stick to, and that is purely because these, these medications has been studied. Um, but as, as a, that is speaking for the group, but for the individual, there are certain health factors that one has to take into account when one makes a recommendation. If I can add to that, and I'd really like Dr. Ellison or Dr. Amiela from um, the Ministry of Health to, to come in. But before this session, we did speak to the officials at the Ministry of Health and asked them specific questions on vaccines, because this is becoming a big question about why can't I also wait for Johnson & Johnson? Um, and the answer that we received and which the Executive Director's Office agreed to be quoted on is that there are two vaccines that are on order, Sputnik 
and Johnson and Johnson. Johnson and Johnson was supposed to have arrived a long time ago, but there are global supply problems at the moment that are delaying it. So it's part of the um, procurement that they did with the African Union Covered Acquisition Task Force. The date that they've now been given is August. The challenge with then saying, I'm going to wait for Johnson & Johnson, you can be told in August that, sorry, our factories across the world are not delivering. The new date is December. God willing, because you're not assured that December is going to come. So this thing of waiting for the ideal vaccine is dangerous. Sputnik, I've been told by the Ministry of Health, is likely to come earlier. Now, again, the challenge is it's not coming tomorrow. Anything can happen that delays the delivery of Sputnik. And what I'm begging the Namibian population not to do is to make the mistake I made, to say, let me wait for Sputnik. Let me wait for Johnson & Johnson. And as I waited for the vaccine that we were told was going to arrive, it never arrived. What did arrive was COVID. And that COVID could have killed myself. It could have killed my husband. If I die, you guys who love me will be sad. You'll cry a few tears. But if something happened to the president of this country, there are constitutional implications. And we must remember that. So, so in hindsight, for, for, for what I believe, is that we took, or I took, a bigger risk waiting for a vaccine than just taking the vaccine that was here. And I'm begging you, don't make the mistake that I made. Uh -huh. And the question by Elaine de Klerk on are we going to die after two years because of AstraZeneca? I think the straightforward answer to that question would be that there really is no way of knowing that you're going to die in two years. You could succumb to some other natural pathology. And the, the, the basic tenet of pathology is if you do not interrupt a disease process, it'll, you'll succumb to it naturally. What I want to say with that is, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't curb the spread of coronavirus in the community, and if we don't gain herd immunity by immunizing ourselves and getting vaccinated, unfortunately what we're going to see is we're going to see this disease come to its natural end, which for some will be death. There's a question by PJ Philemon to you, asking why are we being given certificates after the vaccination if it didn't happen with the, all the other other vaccinations? I think that's misrepresentation of what happened because you are given a vaccine card. I yes. think that's a straightforward answer. Yes, I mean, I, I travel a lot and I have to carry my yellow fever vaccine everywhere I go because so many countries require you to carry a yellow fever vaccine um, card. So, so I'm also surprised by the question. And, and also your childhood vaccine yeah, card. Absolutely. You, you, get, you get a childhood vaccination card. So, so it's, I, I, I so it's not a thing of government is up to something. Yeah. Maybe I must just also circle back to the question about the AstraZeneca vaccine. I think, um, and I agree, we don't, no, none of us can tell the future and, and that's not nearly what the, what the talk is about. But what we know of vaccines in the past, um, vaccine development, how vaccines has been developed, there is no reason to believe at all that this vaccine will cause us any long-term harm, let alone death. Um, yeah. So I think it's just important to highlight that. But people shouldn't forget, we take f the flu vaccine every year and you get which one co comes in or is available to you in the variants that was prevalent um, in the, the flu season. And then so there's a good chance that coronavirus will be the same, that every year you'll get a coronavirus vaccination, the one that's available to you. Um, so people are really making this a very big, big issue when it's actually um, more simple. But I, th I think also just to add on the vaccine issue and the, the fact that we are saying that uh, we are feeding ourselves with information that is untrue. Mm -hmm. For example, we know for a fact whether you deliver in the state or you deliver private you have either a yellow card mm -hmm. for child with vaccination, mm -hmm. and there is a growth chart there that, that we measure. Is the person developing like they are supposed to, or are they under, under nourished? Then we know what it is. And there it says exactly, 
as you are being born, which vaccine do you take? After how many days do you come back again? Six, mm. six yeah. weeks and then whatever. So it is the same with this one. You know, you have that that shows that when were you given what um, um, made it is, expiration date, everything is written there. Who gave it to you? Which site were you given? And then when is your next date? Even for travelers, it's the same. We have all these cards, so we just need to be knowing where to, where to put it. And I think as a nation, we are lucky. We have all these donations that are coming in, and it is available at open spaces. You know, we were told you go to Katutura, you go to Sendra, you go to Lady Pohamba, you go to Rhino. It's for you to choose which of the two that is available now can I take. But then why would you wait for the availability of the others in December when you can live for now? Because we have to live at the moment because as, as the first lady said, we don't know if December will come. But then the fact is you are inviting the illness to come to you. And but others. Yes, and others. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And while we are on the question of medicine, Ivor Macton, there's a question on oh, brother's statement saying, I don't care what the doctors say. I believe in ivermectin and I will use it. Is there anything I should use it with or watch out for? That's a difficult question to answer from a, from a clinician's point of view because um, one always wants to circle back to, to, to what the evidence are. We, what, I, what I would tell the, 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 the questioner is the... Studies that were done on ivermectin in the um, in the current use for for humans, so antiparasitic, for instance, for river blindness and those type of things, the ivermectin had had mild side effects, um, nausea, bit of um, usual diarrhea, those type of symptomatology that you can have. Okay, but the problem is those the dosing schedules for those um, for for those uses are usually a single dose. It's not a repeated dose. Um, and f with a few exceptions, maybe a, a course of up to five days. But n no research has been done on this to say what the long-term effects are. And also not done on what is the, the optimal dose to, um, to, to actually be effective. So at what dose does the, the ivermectin actually kill the coronavirus? Because that's what the, the questioner is, is actually doing or is actually wanting to use it for. And we know in the, in the laboratory setting, the dose where ivermectin will actually kill the coronavirus is an extremely high dose. It's, it's such a high dose that it can, for instance, cross what we call your blood-brain barrier. It's, a, it's a, um, a part of the body's anatomy that protects stuff from getting into the brain. Now, we don't know, for instance, what the, what the effects of having ivermectin at that dose is crossing your blood-brain barrier accumulating in your brain might have because it's never been, s I mean, we won't study that. So it's, it's, it's a d difficult question. I mean, I, and I, I hear the, the question as um, right to autonomy. I mean, everybody has the right to make their own decisions, and I think it's important. Um, but, but one should be very careful for, of the, um, of the long-term consequences and short-term consequences. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bra, it's a very difficult because some people are drinking it as a tablet form. Some are rubbing in oil. Some are putting the oil and drinking it. So, so I'm there's it in milk or something. So there's it. just no um, proper research on what is safe dosages, safe methods of of taking it in. That's very risky to do. Um, okay, yeah. I'm <laughs> Going to anxiety and grief, very touching statement here, saying, I can't believe my mother is dead and I'm angry we couldn't see her properly or even mourn her properly, that is. So in that case, what, can, what would be a remedial situ um, remedy? Okay. Um, the remedy is not an immediate solution because like we said, a grief has different stages. And given the circumstances where, where the mother died and without the person being able to say goodbye to the mother. So obviously it is okay for the person to be angry because that's the first, first reaction we do. We have to be angry at the fact that my mom is gone. And secondly, we have to find somebody to blame mm. for the death or for the loss of the mother. 
you know. And then after that, it's when they get, get into the second stage of actually negotiating with God that you could have taken me instead of my mother. So we are saying allow the person to go through the process of grieving until they come to resolution. And we are saying that in that aspect, if there is nothing else, the depression and the anxiety coming in, we are saying yes, then they need to talk to somebody, reach out so that they go through the counseling be it a psychologist or the psychiatrist. And then we assess and analyze whether they need medication on top of the psychotherapy so that they process the grief. Mm -hmm. I just love before I hand over to the First Lady to close off, uh, Dr. Allison, there are questions here, people asking, people don't want to go to state hospitals as the conditions are said to be bad and people are dying unnecessarily. Question one, two, is it possible for a hospital to only deal with COVID while other and uh, while others other ailments as many people are sick with non-COVID related ailments? So the state hospital is very near and dear to me. I've been working there now for three years. And what I can say is that we are encountered with very intelligent, hard working doctors. People who work there at great personal sacrifice, because let's be honest, you can make a whole lot of money if you work in the state sector. Private but these, sector. Oh, sorry, in the private <laughs> sector. But these doctors um, work in the state facility because they have a vision. Mm -hmm. They believe that they can transform the face of the state's state sector. We have some of the brightest physicians working for us. Even Dr. Brevere sometimes works mm -hmm. at our s state facility, and sometimes it's ex gratis. So ladies and gentlemen, it's not that people are uh, negligent and people are uh, unnecessarily dying in the state hospitals. It's just that we are at the point, we are at the tipping point basically right now where we are faced with not having enough capacity to, to tr treat all of our patients properly. And to the second question that was asked, um, it seems to be that we have run out of steam with regards to treating and managing other conditions in the state facilities because all of our resources now have to be engaging this pandemic. So your grandmother who has heart failure or your grandfather who has prostate cancer, they cannot get the necessary care that they need because everybody has to face this pandemic. So I think that um, so we need to be a little bit careful with what we say and um, this disease that we are faced with, it does not discriminate against those who are wealthy and it does not discriminate against our so uh, socially marginalized populations. So yeah, I just want to say we really want to say that we, I would also like to salute my fellow um, state doctors and mm -hmm. thank you for your hard work. Is it not because of the video circulating on social media depicting the conditions in some of the wards? I will um, have to say that Unfortunately, we are faced with a situation where we have had some pest control issues, but that is completely peripheral to the um, care that you are getting from the doctors that are there with you. We understand that we are understaffed with doctors. We understand that the nursing complement is also overstretched and very thinly spread over. But if you look aside, outside of the aesthetic appeal of the hospital, I mean, it's dilapidated. We have um, cockroach infested wards, we have rat infested wards. But if you look aside at that, you get the same medical doctors, you get the same specialists, you get the same medicines, and this is all ex gratis. So we'd like to emphasize that to the general population. I can also chip in there. Okay, so because I, I, I think it's important that, that we just highlight that in, in the case of COVID, the treatment available to the state patients is exactly the same as it is to the to, to the private patients. And I think it's a very important aspect. I mean, our government has gone to great lengths to procure proper medication um, that 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 is used um, in private sector and in public sector, and one has to commend them for it. I mean, and and many of my my patients also complain. I had to send patients to the state hospitals because I didn't have capacity to to care for them. Um, and and I explained to them in this in this 
case. We, we have to look at it as a country. If you are fortunate enough to get a hospital bed with oxygen at this stage, you are extremely lucky, mm. um, be it in private sector, be it in state sector. And then to have the added benefit of having world-class medications available to you is, 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 a, is, an, is an advantage. And one should really take that, that opportunity not for granted, but, but actually be thankful for it. to say Dr. Bruvet touched on it too is that the fact that we have to to applaud the government and the ministry honestly even with lockdown with uh, suppliers not being able to give us the medication they are trying and they have tried their utmost best so that we do have the medication and and the same this is something very important the same physician or the same psychiatrist who's treating you at nine o'clock or ten o'clock in, in the state is the one who's coming at two o'clock at the private to see you so there's no difference the difference is you don't pay in yeah, state. yeah. Yes, and in the state the they don't service. want mm. to acknowledge the fact that mm. you are actually not even paying for mm. that service that you are getting for free from that person for yes. those hours and even if you are ask to pay yes. it's about thirty dollars less it's thirty dollars and for mental is health that, is that for everything that yeah you, you know your specialists come your intern is running there 24 hours your bloods are yeah. taken lab is not even paid for that yeah. medication everything the drop that you get it's only on that but if you are admitted in mental health mm -hmm. mental health is free in this country so if you're having a comorbid, yes. we still treat you as if the internal medicine person comes to see you. Yes. Or we will call them and say, look, we cannot handle this person. Yes. At least will you do liaison? Liaison, which means you come from your department. Within our department, you treat that person. But people don't appreciate that. We're just condemning the government. We're just condemning the state doctors. We have to appreciate mm. that. I must say, just Blanche, from just experiencing Dr. Ellison and Dr. Hamunyela, who are both state doctors, I, I can't but tell you how much I respect your insights and your, your clear competence. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, my heart bleeds for you. And I can see the almost trauma in your face mm -hmm. and when you speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because you are there because you love what you do and you believe in what you do. And we constantly question your competence. Mm -hmm. We question um, your presence. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm floored by the competence that you two are expressing. And I know that both Dr. Bruvez are exceptionally competent as well. But I definitely think you stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with those in the private sector. And I just want to, I just needed to say that. Thank you, we appreciate it. In 2003 with SARS, I was the intern, so that tells you how old I am, at Ventuk, <laughs> <laughs> at Ventuk Central Hospital, Katura Six um, State Hospital, so we had my intern training. And the, the unit for SARS was there. It was, I think it was Ventuk Central. It was completely managed. And we didn't have so so w and and it was managed and people got better, so I think we are in extraordinary times, mm -hmm. um, where all our hospitals, mm -hmm. all our beds, all our capacity is just overfilled. If it wasn't this significant uh, pandemic, it w could have been like SARS in two thousand and three, where the state could actually just manage it, and yeah, we moved on. Mm -hmm. All right, then, uh, Madam First Lady, to talk to the nation and to wrap up. So we, this is the second session where we've answered most of the questions, and I think, um, if not all the questions, and the questions that we're starting to see are variations of the questions that we've already answered. So we're going to do two things. We're going to have one more session next week, not necessarily with the same people. These are people who are literally saving lives. But what we will do is we'll make smaller clips of the responses for each question so that we avoid the repetition. We'll also transcribe all of our sessions so that we can also start sending out written copies of the responses and we'll make those available in different languages as well. And we'll be working as quickly as we can. Another issue that has come out is the need for mental health assistance on a broader basis. I saw a great uh, poster today where some private sector players have made a, a line available for healthcare workers specifically to be able to call in. I know there's um, certain doctors who are arranging lunches 
for healthcare workers, and I do encourage the public, if you can, go to a hospital, provide something to eat. These are people on their feet for 12 hours who don't have time to make provision for something to eat. Go to any hospital um, that is treating uh, COVID. And then the, the, the other intervention that I know is happening is that very soon, another line will be made where psychologists will be providing 24-7 uh, trauma debriefs for anybody who needs them. So thank you very much and please never forget, love protects.